from computer vision can be applied to those more uh, generic situations. Anyway, that's it for tracking. Uh, onward and upward, pretty soon we'll start talking about uh, recognition and uh, lots of other cool stuff. See you later. All right, welcome back to uh, computer vision. Today we're going to start heading up the computer vision food chain. Uh, we started with uh, basic uh, images as functions. We did some image processing, edge detection, manipulation. Then we did some low-level uh, computation of vision, things like uh, motion, stereo. We considered some geometry, such as things like essential and fundamental matrices that related uh, how cameras were viewing a scene, panoramas, SIF features, etc., uh, even the tracking of objects. But all of that stuff was really semantic-free. And what I mean by semantic-free is there was no notion of what the object was, what you and I would refer to it. So when I look at the table, I see a, a cup of coffee that I paid way too much money for at some really expensive coffee shop because that's what we all do in academia these days. But the idea is that I know that that thing is a cup of coffee. So for this section and a little bit of the discussions we'll be going forward, we're going to be talking about recognition. Recognition being the labeling of the object. In particular, we typically think of it as uh, labeling objects with labels that humans would understand. The other thing I want to say before we begin is we're only going to do a little bit of this. And that's because object rec recognition has become hugely driven by machine learning. Machine learning is a general field where you have lots of data that uh, some of which is, is often labeled or supervised, described what's there. And you have training data and you use that to be able to do uh, label or categorize or describe some new novel input. We're going to talk a little bit about that, but only a little because machine learning is such a big field that if you want to understand more of the details, you, you, you almost need to take an entire machine learning course. So we'll be touching on the underlying machine learning methods, especially a couple of lessons from now. Um, but mostly we'll try to talk a bit about how it's been applied to a computer vision scenario. So what does recognition entail? Well, it's actually many different tasks. One example is somebody might show you a particular area and say, you know, is that a lamp? Okay, and that's verification. And in this particular case, what I mean is that it's verification of a general class. Okay, is this thing a lamp? We'll get to identification in a minute. Another possibility is you might say, are there any people here? And that would be detection. That is, I haven't told you where in the image to look. I just want to know, are there any people in this scene? Another is, I might have a specific instance. And I might show you an example and say, is that Potala Palace? That's in this particular case of a location of a thing. Sometimes identification, we all know, is in faces, right? I show you and say, you know, is this Megan? And you say, no, that's not nearly as nice as Megan. But anyway, that's identification. A more interesting question is what we'll loosely call categorization. All right, so you're generally putting out a label. You know, here we have this label that in the background there are mountains and there's trees over here, there's people here, vendors. This thing was a street lamp, these are buildings. And this is what's referred to as object categorization, and we're going to talk more about that. But we might also want to just label the entire scene. Say, you know, this is an outdoor city uh, where people go and buy stuff. All right, so that was also would entail some form of uh, recognition. So there are all these different ways you can think about what recognition is. And one of the two main distinctions we already talked about, but it pays to point it out again, is this difference between single instance labeling. Okay, so here's a picture of a car, and we say, you know, that's John's car. Okay, and so we want to be able to find that particular thing versus we'd like to be able to find all of these things and say, okay, those are cars. For the most part, we're going to be worrying about this problem, the generic categorization problem. Okay, so object categorization can be described in a variety of ways. This was a slide from Kristen and uh, Barrett Lieba, and then I changed it a little bit. Generically, it's kind of like this. Given some number of training examples, training images of a category, recognize some a priori unknown instances of that category and assign the correct label. Now, you'll notice that I put down small in parentheses. You know, right here it says small. These days, not a lot of work is done on the small number. That is, typically we have lots of large examples. And there's a question about how methods that go from taking large data could then use small data. To me, that's a slightly more interesting problem. But we'll leave the small as being sort of optional at this point. But the basic idea is that I give you a set of these things and some sort of labels, and you want to give me back uh, the correct label. All right. So one of the things we have to do before we can even proceed is we have to agree on a set of labels. And there's this fundamental problem that a single object doesn't have a unique label. So here we have somebody's dog apparently named Fido. I don't know if anybody names their dogs Fido anymore. 
So you can say, well, this is Fido, or you could say this is a German Shepherd. You could say this is a dog. You could say it doesn't even say, you could say it's a mammal. You could say it's an animal. You could say it's a living thing, although a living being is probably, I don't know, et cetera. But it, it is these things, right? So there's this question is, what categories are best for visual identification, or which ones do we agree upon? Well, to get some inspiration about this, let's talk about what humans do and visual object categories in humans. And there was work in what's referred to as basic level categories in human categorization. It was st uh, started by Eleanor Roche, a series of seminal papers back in the 70s, continued on by Lakoff and other uh, cognitive scientists. And what they found is there are certain levels of description that seem to have a preferred place in human cognition. So for example, the basic level was the highest level in the category, which you could say that objects have the same or similar perceived shape. So if I ask you to think of the shape of a German Shepherd, you can, but if I ask you to think of the shape of a dog, you probably can do that too. If I ask you to think of the shape of a mammal, what you're going to do is you're going to think of the shape of a couple of representative types of mammals. You don't actually have a shape uh, for mammal. Typically, also, you can make a mental image. If I say, you know, make a mental image of a dog, you'll probably come up with something. If I say, make a mental image of an animal, you're going to pick some animal, and then if I were to ask you what it was, you wouldn't tell me it's an animal, you would tell me it was a deer or something like that. By the way, you can do uh, reaction time experiments where, let's suppose you want to ask people to push a button, yes or no, I'm going to show them a picture, and one task is you're supposed to say, is it an animal? Another task is you're supposed to say whether it's a dog. It turns out, you're faster at knowing that it's a dog than you are at knowing that it's an animal. And that's a very robust finding, and you, you, can, you can do that. And then there's this thing that typically, this is the level of children understand earlier. Uh, so they'll learn about dogs before they'll learn about animals. They'll, they'll learn these words. And there's one written here about having motor actions interact. You can imagine that there's a set of things you do with dogs that sort of span dogs, right? There's probably not the same set of things you do with animals, right? You probably pet dogs, you're probably willing to pet most dogs, probably all dogs generically if you're a dog person. The idea is that you have these, these interactions. So there's this preferred level within a human. And you might wonder why I'm spending so much time talking to you about this. Well, if you go to the MIT uh, libraries and you were to type in, you could actually find this thing called not natural object categorization, which by the way was my PhD thesis back in 1987. Please don't go and read it. It's not so great. But I was worried about this notion of perceptual uh, organization and how you would organize your categories to make them good for perception. The one thing I lucked out on is that when, by the time I did my thesis, the AI tech reports were up to 1,001. So I got tech report 1,001 as the number. And, um, and that's great because it sounded like it was an important one or first. All right, enough of that. But this idea of which categories are best for visual identification is a challenge for uh, doing uh, uh, this labeling. So let's assume for a moment that we're going to have some set of visual categories. A question you might ask is about how many of them are there? It's kind of a weird question to ask, you know, how many types of things are there? But, you know, look, we've got a finite amount of gelatinous stuff between our ears, and there's this question of sort of how many different labels do you deal with? So Irv Biederman, a psychologist, and does work in uh, cognitive vision and, and uh, mental models for doing vision. Back in the, in the 80s, he, he came up with this number of about 10 to 30,000, okay? Now, big range. But it's an interesting idea because it's also related, if you take a look at the number of nouns people know, that is, you could ask, how many nouns do you know? Well, it's not going to be 2 million and it's not going to be 11. At least I hope if you're watching this, it's not 11. Okay? It's in the tens of thousands of range. Okay? So it gives you some idea of sort of the scale of the recognition problem. There are, by the way, other types of categories other than just sort of natural categories. So for example, you think about functional categories. So here's a set of chairs. And yes, you can sit in all these things, although some of them look like they would be kind of stunningly uncomfortable. But they don't really share a visual property. So you can imagine that semantically in your head, you know that they have a certain relationship. But from a recognition perspective, it's not clear that the same process that recognizes this as a chair should also recognize that as a chair. Uh, another type of category which is valid but not perceptually relevant might be these sort of ad hoc categories of things you find in an office environment. That's a perfectly natural category. In fact, it's even a category which you can think about probabilistic reasoning as biasing things, right? If I tell you you're in an office, 
you're much more likely to find a stapler, right, than to find a horse whip. So maybe that would bias your recognition. But the notion of it being a single visual category, as you can see from these objects, doesn't make a lot of sense. So why are we working on the recognition problem? Well, recognition, it's a fundamental part of perception. Whether you're talking about robots, autonomous agents, whatever, the idea is that the ability to know what things are and therefore how you want to interact with them is really important. It, it gives you a way of organizing and thinking about the visual content of the world. And perhaps even more importantly, it's a very human way of thinking about things, right? I, I give objects labels, and if I tell you to go pick up the cup and put it away, you know what I'm talking about. So we want our machines and systems to be able to do that too. So for example, autonomous agents, and here's a pair. The one on the left is a robot. This is from Karlsruhe, Tamim Asfor, and Rudiger Dillon's work on um, domestic robot. And this robot has to be able to go pick up cups out of dishwashers. It has to know that there is a dishwasher. It has to see that, oh, I put that cup down, it didn't make it, I'm going to get it. It has to be able to be told that the cups go over there. All right. So if I'm going to communicate about these things to that robot, I'm going to use labels that talk about these objects. Even an autonomous system. So here, I think this was uh, Stanley. I think that was one of the Urban Grand Challenge vehicles, uh, one of the winners. It has to understand that this is a thing, and this thing, we know that it's called a car. All it needs to know is it's this thing that it learned a lot of things about, and that this kind of thing, which are cars, do things like continue moving, might stop, have certain behaviors. Likewise, that this object there might move uh, in your way. And it uses a lot of machine learning to do that. Maybe not quite the traditional labeling the way, but the idea is that uh, these autonomous agents understand the nature of, of the world being carved up in objects, and I can communicate about them, and it can autonomously detect them. Labeling people, that's a recognition task. This is something we do all the time. You know, every time you tag folks on uh, Facebook and it both finds that it is a face, and we'll talk about detection in a little bit, but it also, you might want to know who it is. Peter Bellamer and folks did these digital field guides where you'd like to be able to, like, maybe take a picture of a leaf and say, you know, what kind of leaf is that? If you're into that nature kind of thing, which I'm not. But it's this idea of being able to, to recognize these things. And maybe you found some really expensive stuff online and you say, please find me more shoes that look like this for any relatives of mine that I'm still continuing to subsidize. So you could use computer vision to help you find less expensive shoes. Just saying. All right, the idea of, you know, can I find something that looks kind of like that so I have to recognize that it's a shoe, maybe it's already labeled a shoe, recognize the type, that kind of thing. Why is this hard? Well, because uh, unlike some early computer vision data sets, we don't typically take an object, put it on a piece of black felt or velvet on top of a table and say, okay, that is a fire truck toy, right? Pictures show up more like this. And I think this also comes from Kristen because she has a thing for pandas and I think also for koalas. All right? You get great variations in how things are illuminated, the pose of objects. The objects are sort of seen in the background with a bunch of clutter. They get occluded. So here, you know, there's trees in the way, you know, the viewpoint. And then, oh, isn't this a really cute face of a koala? Yeah, but you know what? To another koala, he might not really like this guy because he, like, ran off with his poker chips or something. I don't know. The idea is that, you know, they, they look different one to another. So the idea that we have these variations uh, in appearance. The other thing is that these objects don't show up again in isolation. They show up in these cluttered, overlapping environments. You know, here's this picture of these uh, two motorcycles, one behind the other. People, of course, walking pedestrians. We don't get to look at objects uh, in isolation, typically. Another thing that makes this hard is the importance of context. And let me show you three pictures, okay? So you take a look at these pictures, and you probably see a person here talking on his cell phone. You probably see here an outdoor scene with a building and like some people standing, et cetera, whatever. And you probably see some guy, I don't know exactly what he's doing, bending down, maybe picking something up, and here's his shoe over there. Right? Right. Well, hmm. You see these regions? So that's the phone, the person, the shoe. You see this single picture here? Let me blow up that picture a little bit more, okay? This patch of intensities is the same patch here as here as here as there. So what's a cell phone in one image is a shoe in another image. And that could only be done by the context of everything else that's around it. This also makes recognition difficult. Another challenge is the complexity. That is, we need to be able to compute things and do it relatively quickly because you know, there are 
thousands, now, now millions of pixels in an image. We've got, I don't know, three to 30, some tens of thousands of object categories.